with Dr. Patricia Ramsey, president of Medgar Evers College. Dr. Ramsey is the sixth president and first female president to lead this historic institution. Our first guest for this inaugural, um, the launch of our lecture series is the 55th governor of New York, David Patterson. Today's theme is access to advocacy through public service. For this, this lecture series, this first one, our first female president is having a conversation with the first black governor of New York, Dr. Ramsey. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Whitehead. And it's truly an honor to have this opportunity uh, to meet with Governor David Patterson, um, the first black governor and the only one that I'm aware of, uh, of the state of New York. And um, I'd just like him to just say hello to everyone and then we'll get into a conversation. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Ramsey, and congratulations on becoming the first woman president of Medgar Everett's College. Uh, that's really quite exciting to know. And, and also I read that you're the first scientist who's been the president of Medgar Evers College. And uh, so I think that you bring a unique background to the position and it's, it's very exciting to have been invited today. And I've uh, spoken at the school before and I hope the next time I speak at the school, it will be like the last few times I spoke there in person. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you, because I would love to have an opportunity uh, to interact with you in an in-person format, um, but wonderfully, uh, we have technology today that enables us to be able to do this uh, in, a, in a virtual format. And it is an exciting time in history for us all, in my opinion, because uh, we have an opportunity to do things in a, in a very different way. Now, the pandemic, as you know, has, has changed the life of America and the world. And so it is causing us to, to think in different ways. And I don't see um, us returning to life as it was before, uh, because these virtual formats have enabled us to do some things that we would not otherwise been able, would have been able to do. And so thank you, thank you, thank you for being with us. And I'm excited actually to, to talk a little bit about your book and your, and your life. I mean, when you see a book entitled Black, Blind and In Charge, <laughs> it elicits many thoughts in people's minds. And I want to hold this up for the audience to see. Um, if you don't have a copy of it, please do get a copy of it. Um, some very interesting information. Even if you just read the cover and you see a quote by the governor. And he says, I've had this desire my whole life to prove people wrong, to show them I could do things they didn't think I could do. And so what I'd like to start our conversation out with is tell us what you meant by that. Well, uh, I was born in Brooklyn. That's the first part I want to uh, elicit. And when I was school age, I couldn't, well, I couldn't attend school in public school. So they were going to send me to a special school for the blind and, you know, for the other disabilities, they had schools for the deaf, but they did not have disabled children in public education. And my mother wasn't having it. So she went to Westchester and she even went into Connecticut. And she came back and went out to Long Island. Um, and she found a school district in Hempstead, Long Island that said that they had had uh, blind students in the school and that if she moved the family to Hempstead that they would welcome me as one of the students. Well, uh, my father was trying to start a political career in uh, New York City and um, he got moved to Long Island with the rest of us. So you could see who was running the show in that relationship. and. Uh, First day of school, the kindergarten teacher says to her, listen, do me a favor, take David home, bring him back in, the, in a week while I get the class settled down. My mother explained to the kindergarten teacher that she was a third grade teacher at PS 116 in Queens, and she'd be happy to get the class calmed down in a half an hour. But either way, she told the uh, teacher, my son is gonna sit there. 
So, um, you know, I was, you know, when I was younger, I used to feel that my mother was harder on me than my brother. and that She really gave me a hard time. And I think that she just felt that she had to push me harder, lest I start to think that I wouldn't be capable and wouldn't be, uh, uh, you know, up to the task or able to do what the, the other students were, uh, were, was doing. And this catches up with me, uh, Dr. Ramsey, when I'm a, uh, just finished my sophomore year at Columbia University, I graduated the Hempstead Public School System the high school in three years instead of four. I'm on the honor roll at Columbia. And so I guess, as you could say, I was on a roll. But I went to a barbecue over Memorial Day weekend. And this gentleman who knew my family and, you know, we were all friends, he told me and a friend of mine to go find 15 young people that were looking for jobs this summer. Now, by that time, I was 19 years old, but I had never had a job. And I was a little, worried about how all my other friends seemed to get one every summer. And so we rounded up 13 people and we put our two names on the list and he hired everyone except me. Mm. And my reaction uh, to this was quite uh, antagonistic. And my parents said, well, maybe he's still hiring people. And that's the first time I had a real adult fight with my parents. It wasn't about what time I came home the night before or whether or not my room was clean. It was that I didn't think they could understand that this man didn't think that I could put sandwiches in a, and an apple in a box and close them because the job was preparing food for school lunches uh, during, uh, the, the, uh, d- during uh, summer school, you know, summer, mm-hmm. camp, summer camp lunches. So um, unfortunately, uh, when the gentleman found out that my parents weren't happy that he d- uh, didn't hire me, he put the final knife in my heart. He hired my brother. Now, my brother was three years younger than me, was technically not old enough to, to have a job at that point. So I felt he broke the law twice. First, he discriminates against me. Then he hires a person who's underage. And I went back to Columbia University and couldn't pick up a book. I just didn't see why I was working so hard and studying so hard if I could never get a job. And so Mm. I wind up on academic probation and I go to the dean's office. And you would think that a dean in a college that sees this dramatic change in a student's performance would even ask him why this happened. No, he yells at me and tells me I'm the first student in the history of Columbia University to go from the dean's list to effectively dropping out. And at that point, I went to see a professor who I really liked, even though I'd never had a one-to-one conversation with him. But something pushed me to go and talk to him. And he said to me, David, I feel very badly for you. Your parents didn't understand. Your friends that you got the job for didn't speak up for you. Your brother took the job that you should have gotten. And, um, you know, all these things happen. But I didn't hear anywhere in this story that you stood up for yourself. Why didn't you put a sign on that man's building that uh, and saying something like, this company discriminates against the blind and call up the local newspaper. I'll bet somebody would have talked to you then. And he said to me, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to the Dean's office for you. We're gonna wipe out your last semester, I promise you. We're not gonna give you your money back, but we're gonna wipe out your last semester. And you're gonna go uh, away for a year and then you can come back. So I said to him, well, what am I supposed to do when I go away? And he said, Go find a job. That seems to be the thing that interests you the most these days. Prove to yourself that you can find one. But this time, when someone tries to stop you, stand up to them. So Mm -hmm. I went to work for a place called Municipal Credit Union. I actually had so much fun working there. I worked there. I stayed there two years. Mm -hmm. And I came back to Columbia University. And as they say, the stone the builder refused became the governor of the state of New York. How about that? How about that? So you proved them wrong uh, in many ways. But I, I think that it's, it's very interesting, um, the piece that you said about um, the, the dean saying, well, you didn't stand up for yourself. And so here you are, you not only um, learn to stand up for yourself, but learn to stand up for others. 
So, uh, and, I, and I heard you speak about your mom and uh, very strong. I have no doubt of it, just listening to, to what you shared. Um, but in your book, you speak about your dad. You didn't speak much about him. You did speak a little bit about him then. But, but tell me, is, as, it relates to, as it relates to your dad, um, can you tell me how he may have influenced some of your decisions? Well, I think because my mom was pushing so hard for me to do these things, my dad assumed the figure of the warmer, like the one who would give you a hug. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, I remember I got a bad report card once and I just was fearing when he came home and he came in and he said to me, listen, um, this is way below what you're capable of doing. We have to sit and discuss why you're not getting the work done. And that's how we're gonna turn it around. So he had a unique capacity to know when to uh, be critical and when not to be. Uh, he was the person that, you know, if you did something wrong, you didn't get yelled at by him. He just quietly explained in a very warm way what was wrong. He would wait until you're like on top of the world to be critical. So when I become the minority leader of the New York State Senate, I give an 18 minute speech and uh, the crowd is cheering wildly. And he walks up to me and he says, you know, by the way, during the speech, you use the word appraise when you meant a prize. <laughs> I said, this is your takeaway from coming <laughs> to see me sworn in as minority leader today? And he says, uh, yeah, I just thought I'd tell you about it. I said, well, I'd like to apprise you of the fact that you are a jerk. You know, <laughs> in other words, when he gave you a hard time, it's when he knew you could take it. When he felt, and I saw him do this with other people, that they were uh, unsure of themselves or having difficulty, um, he wanted to be the person to make them feel uh, uh, welcome. And what I would say is that uh, that sort of uh, conduct was why when the teacher said to me, um, you didn't stand up for yourself. And when I was able to come back to the school and graduate, I realized that a lot of other people may not have had that voice talking to them at that time, or they may not have had the family support that I had. And I decided, that was when I decided I wanted to go into public service because I wanted to do for other people what was done for me. Great, thank you. And uh, that that brings me to uh, the question. And you, you you actually, I was thinking in my mind as you you spoke about uh, the public service um, because, of course, I understand that your dad uh, was a part of the Gang of Four, if you will. Uh, <laughs> and and so, uh, of course, uh, former Mayor Mayor Dinkins and um, uh, former Congressman. Uh, well, he. Uh, was Congressman at Charles Rangel and um, Mr. Percy Sutton and your dad, of course. So um, my question that I had before you mentioned about public service, what did that gang of four, what influence did they have? Because I'm sure they all played very different roles. Um, what, what influence did they have on your uh, decision to go into public service? And even while you were in public service, some of the decisions that you made. Well, first, Dr. Ramsey, I'm going to break a little news for you. In 1985, uh, some of that group were having a political feud with uh, the former Bronx Borough president, the former Congressman Herman Badillo. And it led to a kind of split between the Black and Puerto Rican communities, which usually were on the same side of things. And it had to do with the fact that Herman Badillo felt that Percy Sutton had interfered with his chance to become mayor of New York by running against him in 1973. So his way of returning the favor was to run against Percy Sutton when he ran for mayor in 1977. So basically twice they each made each other lose. So <laughs> this feud is getting larger and larger. And Badillo thought he was going to get the support of a group called the Coalition. I can't exactly remember the a coalition for a better New York, which was an African-American group. And he thought he was gonna get the nomination 
And instead, the nomination was given to a Manhattan assemblyman who was also the county leader named Denny Farrell. Herman Badillo then said in the newspaper, it was a gang of four who stopped him. But he meant Charles Rangel, Percy Sutton, uh, 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 Basil Patterson, and, and Denny Farrell. Actually, he, he didn't mean Sutton. He meant, uh, but that, that was the four people he was talking about. But because the uh, Sutton and Patterson and Wrangell and Dinkins sort of uh, just the way they interacted with each other, it was always assumed that the, 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 um, that the comment was meant for them. And eventually, like a lot of things, it starts out where you're denigrating someone but then mm -hmm. in the end, you are actually complimenting them because they embraced the term, the gang of four. And I mm -hmm. think the reason that they were so, success, so successful is they were not afraid to stand up and speak the truth to power. I think that was basically it. I would say that Percy Sutton was the soul of the group. Uh, he had a standard of how he thought uh, people should conduct themselves when they're advocating. I would say that uh, uh, Charles Rangel was kind of the mind of the group. He was the one that always had the ideas about uh, economic development and uh, health care and um, a House Select Committee on Narcotics and Abuse, which he founded. I think that my father was kind of like uh, the conscience of the group. Um, he always seemed to be um, taking what the others had suggested and putting it in a way that uh, their advocacy could be fulfilled. And I think that David Dinkins was really the symbol of the group um, because he was the young, he was really embodied uh, just the whole um, idea of how to be a gentleman and speak out at the same time. And that's why they all gathered around him to make him the mayor of the city of New York. So I think that's why they're all uh, remembered so fondly. Well, um, I'm thinking now about um, related, very, very related. I'm thinking now about um, reading where um, there was gonna be a, a big rally, if you will, and, um, and a lot of, um, celebrity types might have been in the crowd, and um, and you were a young, I believe, a young senator, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, and um, and you were there, and there was this guest that no one knew was going to be there, <laughs> Muhammad Ali. Can you yeah. just tell me about that? Well, um, uh, it was a march to protest the conditions in South Africa. I had been a state senator for three months. So I'm very junior and I'm trying to be respectful, respectful of the legislators who have been there before. And uh, they all go over to meet Muhammad Ali and the staff member who usually accompanied me was not with me that day, an intern was, and he lost me in the crowd. So I'm in a crowd by myself. And he said to Muhammad Ali, oh, go meet the new state senator, he's the third youngest state senator ever elected. And Muhammad Ali comes over and he says, how are you? And he shook my hand and I said, I'm fine, nice to meet you. And I walked right past him. <laughs> oh. Muhammad Ali turns to the other elected officials and he says, well, I can see why you politicians are so out of touch. This guy over here doesn't even know who I am. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, David Dinkins, who was, had just been elected borough president, tells Muhammad Ali about my legal blindness. Mm -hmm. And Muhammad Ali apparently was very taken aback by what he said and felt bad that he would made fun of me. So he comes over to me the second time. It's, but since they're all with him, this time I know it's him. And I'm like, oh, no, what did I do? <laughs> he puts his arm around me and he takes my hand in his hand, almost like I'm the prom date. And he says, um, would you march with me? And by then he was already losing his voice. I didn't hear it the first time. I said, uh, I'm sorry, champ, what did you say? And this time he leans down and he says, right in my ear, would you march with me? I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna march with Muhammad Ali. So they put me in the line and Muhammad Ali's on my right and on the left there's this guy, I don't know if 
Have you ever heard of him, doctor named Arthur Ashe, the tennis star? <laughs> uh, I, I'm from Virginia, so yes, I know Arthur Ashe. All about Arthur Ashe. So, so, and all these cameras are going off. I couldn't believe it. And we're walking down Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard in Harlem, and everyone's watching us. But behind me, I can hear this groveling. I've been in office for 17 years. Who the, you know what? thinks he, what, who does he think he is standing up there marching with Muhammad Ali like he's the most important person here? I didn't do that, he asked me to. But um, finally, this is when the, uh, uh, you know, the, the illness had started to, to get to Muhammad Ali, where he had his arm around me, he was now leaning on me. And I'm staggering because at the time, he must have weighed about 270, 280 pounds. And I weighed about 145 pounds soaking wet. And I'm trying to hold him up. And this, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm turning different <laughs> colors because he's, it's just so hard to do this. And we uh, get down to right where Central Park is. And his people realize he won't be able to walk through the terrain in the park. You know, there's mm -hmm. a flat street. And they take him out, out of the... Uh, they take him away. When they take him away, I almost fall down. I'm so tired. And one of them wow. grabs my arm and he says, was, was he too much for you? And I looked at the guy, Muhammad Ali is looking at me. And I said, well, he was too much for Sonny Liston. He was too much for George Foreman. He was too much for Joe Frazier. Of course he was too much for me. And oh, I love it. started laughing and got in his car and waved and closed the door. And I thought, my life could end right here. I made Muhammad Ali laugh. Like to me, that was the greatest thing I'd ever done. <laughs> oh, and, and, and that shows how quick witted you are because uh, that, that was so great because sometimes people try to make things negative. And right. so um, it, what you did was really show him to be the champ that he truly was. And so um, I, I think that that's, that's just commendable. And so uh, when, when you think about, because uh, you, you were walking there with Muhammad Ali, you were feeling that pressure of, his, of the weight um, as he was leaning on you. Um, and so as I think about that, um, I think about challenges and how, how you deal with challenges. What would you say during all of your political career, um, what would be the most challenging um, time that you had? I think the most challenging time was the beginning of the last year when I was governor. And I, uh, there was some sort of meeting between some business leaders and, um, and a potential candidate against me. And uh, they sent me this message back that they really thought I should run, that I should not run for reelection. And that if I didn't run, they'd like to help, you know, me in my career as I move forward. Mm -hmm. And I told them I am running. And uh, I had lived 55 and a half years up to that point and never was accused of anything. But in the next two months, I got accused of everything. And it was so obviously coordinated and, and I was able to beat all the charges, but I knew I couldn't govern the state, run for office and uh, face the accusations at the same time. So I had to make the announcement that I was not gonna seek reelection. And I think that didn't go over well with a lot of people who supported me, but I really honestly could say that if I had tried to run for election, I'd have gotten indicted for something. I don't know what it would have been, but they would have found a reason. And the, the uh, anxiety and the frustration of that time, um, uh, I, I was able to fight through it, but when I left office and now the pressure was off, I still felt the um, pain of those moments. And, um, you, you know, sometimes, I, <laughs> oddly enough, I was talking to someone who had told me I was gonna become governor before I was. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he's kind of a psychic. And, uh, he, and he doesn't even read people, he just is psychic. And he's, I said to him, why, why am I going through this? And he said, you know, sometimes God, sometimes God asks us to walk through a storm. You've walked through the storm, the storm is over, now move on. And when he said that, 
I was able to do that. Uh, well, uh, what you what you just shared uh, is interesting um, because I, I was I was just thinking about uh, social justice and you and and really when you said yes, they would have indicted me on something I don't know what it would have been, um, and the the lecture series that we're doing here today uh, is 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 decoding uh, social justice because as you know. Uh, Mega Everest College is named after uh, a, a, a great civil rights uh, leader, uh, Mega Wally Evers. And so as an institution, we have so, uh, social justice in our DNA. And uh, what I'd like to hear from you is what, what does social justice, what does that mean to you? Social justice to me means fulfilling the dreams of those men and women, both living and the dead, and both white and black and later on Asians and Hispanics, who struggled in this country for over 200 years and struggled unremittingly to try and create economic, political and social justice for African-Americans. And those I think uh, are, the goals of social justice to to actually reach that point. Unfortunately, uh, it has been met with a real antagonism uh, from groups that have always been antithetical to our progress. And it's still going on today. So let's take an issue, um, uh, you know, such as the fact that there are some people who would like to change the educational system. And I would admit some of the suggestions that they have, I think, go too far. But they uh, don't seem to understand that the educational system as it exists right now is guilty of exactly what they are being accused of themselves. So, for instance, there are 27 counties in the state of Texas that refer to the migration of Africans to the United States as an invitation for them to come over and help do chores on the farms. This is what they turn the most brutalizing slavery that anybody could think of in the last two or 3,000 years that they redefined it in that way. There are 13 Southern states that teach in their school books that the Civil War was a battle between the North and the South over states' rights, never mentioning slavery in the books at all. So we're still uh, battling this desire of people to masquerade uh, what I call the new racism, which is that it denies the existence of racism itself and takes no responsibility for inequality, that they are disguising it by casting out anyone who questions the system we have now as being un-American or outrageous or militant or whatever it is that they, they want to say about uh, people who are trying to, uh, to, to reach that plateau of social justice that we've been fighting for for a few centuries. So that's what it actually means to me uh, in the midst of just uh, the rewriting of history, the mis- uh, guided impression of things that were actually going on, and sometimes the outright denial of tragedies that killed uh, many people in the name of perpetuating racism. Yeah, um, you know, the, 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 the last few years has really, I think, um, brought to, to, to surface things that we have known for years, um, those of us who have, have had experiences uh, with dealing with uh, what we would call biases uh, in the system that people don't even recognize until they themselves um, have, to, have to experience those, those biases. Um, as you know, uh, for example, uh, with the uh, marijuana and the, the fact that most of the people who uh, were put in jail or in prison uh, for, for marijuana were, were, were black and brown people. 
And now states are looking at, at legalization. And so um, Mega Everest College is the, the first institution in CUNY to offer a, an academic program um, in cannabis education. And so um, we're looking at it from various perspectives. Uh, we have two professors, uh, one in business and one in um, chemistry and environmental sciences department, her area is chemistry, that actually are the lead faculty on this. And we started our first course um, this past fall. What advice uh, would you give to us as it relates to how we approach um, this, this whole idea of cannabis education and how can uh, what we do impact the community in a positive way? What, what advice would you give us um, regarding that, that cannabis education program? Well, first of all, I'm, I, I knew before you said it, but I'm delighted to hear that Medgar Evers is thinking five to 10 years down the road by setting up the uh, curriculum that could actually empower people to step right in and start operating businesses or sales of the product or um, working in the field involving medical marijuana. What happened in New York is I think a crying shame. They decided to give 10 companies uh, a runway, two years that they could operate, they would have licenses, and then they would use the taxes that they paid to spread it around and start to help other companies. Of the 10 companies, eight of them were owned by white males. One was owned by a white female and the last one was owned by a group of people in Syracuse who were African-American. Within six months, one of the eight white male companies bought out the Syracuse company. And so now you had nine companies, all of them white. And and they had their lobbyists, you know, the, the, the state, people lobbying before the state were saying, oh, but we're going to get all their taxes to start the other businesses. But by the time the other businesses had started, they would have created basically a monopoly, which is the biggest problem we have with minority and women's business uh, owners right now. They could do the work, but they can't get the contracts because they're not as big as the other companies. So I think that we have to move away from apprenticeships into partnerships and that we've got to insist on it. One of the saddest moments in my life was in 2017, I went to uh, an event in Albany uh, during the black Puerto Rican uh, and, and Hispanic and Asian uh, weekend. And when I walked around and I saw people and people came up and they remembered me and I remembered them, I didn't see one person that I didn't know before because these programs had uh, missed the mark that we intended when we founded them, when uh, we totally reorganized the MWBE program in uh, 2008 after it had been destroyed by Governor Pataki. It was originally started by Governor Mario Cuomo who had a good program there. So my answer to the question is there's gotta be vigilance uh, when these little deals get made that actually thwart the attempt of uh, our community to share in the resources and also the rewards of strong business. Yeah, uh, thank you. And that when I when I came here to uh, Mega Everest May of, of last year, um, I had the privilege of sitting. Um, uh, chairing the council um, where that program was presented and uh, was glad to support it because um, it's, uh, it's typically our communities who are the last to get on get in on any, any industry. And to see uh, Mega Everest College be the first in CUNY to um, have, a, have a program, I was just very, very supportive of it. Of course, it doesn't hurt that I'm a botanist and I have done a lot of work in the uh, in, in research looking at the impacts of uh, of plant extracts uh, on the uh, microorganisms. But um, one of the one of the things that we want to do with the program, in addition to the the side of a formal um, getting a formal degree uh, with a minor, 
is to also um, have opportunity for people in the community to, to get certificates uh, so that they can then go to these various industries and um, have the, 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 the training that's, that's needed. And, and many times people think about growing um, or dispensing, but there are so many other aspects um, that, um, that we could be involved in. And so one of the things you, you mentioned uh, about maybe we need to have more people coming together as partners um, that we can just leverage more. And so that's one of the things we're looking at partners. Um, we've actually look, looked at um, a number of partners uh, locally, but uh, because the program received a lot of attention, um, we've actually gotten uh, people from other states contacting us, uh, other educational institutions contacting us to see if they can partner with us where they have started programs perhaps, or they're doing something on a smaller scale in, in their state. But we would really love to see um, people who have um, had the misfortune of um, having to go into the, um, into the system, into the, into the, um, the, the penal institutions, if you will. Uh, we would love to be able to see them be able to benefit because their lives have been snuffed away for some years. And now many of them are able to get out to educate the community so that then we can help to uplift the community economically. Um, and that really is a part of our social justice mission um, here at, at Mega Evers College. And, um, and so I just wanted to get your, your, your take on that um, because of course, anything that's new, um, people always have a lot of questions and some people uh, are a little bit concerned. Some people have things that they say under their breath or to others and not say to you. And so um, I appreciate this because we had an opportunity for you to share um, with us publicly. We are nearing the end of our time. So what, what I'd like to, um, to, to find out is, is there anything that you would like to share with us this evening that we haven't spoken about because um, you have had so many experiences and, um, and we just love to hear uh, whatever it is that, that you would like to say at this time. Well, I'm just going to tell a little story since it is Black History Month. And this is a, a Black history story. And okay. it has to do with a famous jazz singer whose name was Bessie Smith. And uh, she was one of the two real popular uh, African-American women jazz singers back in the 30s, 40s, that era. Uh, the other singer being Billie Holiday. Well, um, doctor, do you know the story about uh, Bessie, Bessie Smith's demise? Do you happen to know how she passed away? I do not. Okay, well, the commonly believed story is that Bessie Smith was in a car and was in a car accident and was re re refused admission by a white hospital in I believe the state of Georgia. And uh, that's always been what people thought and it was you know, very angering that this big star couldn't get into a hospital. Uh, her arm was hanging out of the passenger's window and was hit by another car so her arm uh, was, you know, severely injured and, and she basically bled to death. Mm -hmm. So um, finally, I read in the biography of Bessie Smith written by a man named Chris Albertson. And I read this 40 years ago, that that's not what happened. What happened was Bessie Smith was in a car accident. A doctor showed up, he had a brand new car. He was afraid that she would bleed all over his car, if they put her in the car. And he said, just find someone to get her to the hospital and we'll try to save her. They did get her to the hospital. They tried to save her, but they couldn't. The family obviously was very angry that the doctor didn't let them use his car because they could have gotten there earlier, but that's anger at an individual. He didn't want to do that. Um, the story came from the record company. The record company wrote that on her albums to antagonize the black community 
who were her biggest fans. Billie Holiday had more of a diverse audience. Most of Bessie Smith's real fans that came to her uh, concerts and bought her albums uh, were, were black. And the uh, Bessie Smith's records went to the top of the charts because people thought they were supporting her by buying the albums when all they were doing was supporting the people who owned the uh, record company who were of a different hue. So I say this just to make this point. Throughout the history of this country, there's been the same antagonism, uh, forgetting the fact that African-Americans held the first Memorial Day celebration on May 1st, 1865, then copied by the Southern whites. And by the time they had a National Memorial Day, they forgot about the black people from Charleston, South Carolina, who held the first Memorial Day. So the great thing about African-American History Month is this time we get to tell the real story. And it isn't just the history of black people in America, it's the history of America itself. So every time that we go over these um, incidents and uh, situations that came up, I'm just so happy that we're doing it now and some of the great secrets have um, come to uh, historic fruition uh, because of the hard work of researchers uh, like yourself, Dr. Ramsey. And, um, and so I couldn't be more happy than to have been invited today. Well, thank you so much. Um, I so appreciate uh, having this time with you and, um, and, and mentioning uh, what you did about, uh, about the history and about the story of, of Bessie Smith. Um, just the thing that people don't seem to understand is if you don't know history, you are apt to repeat some of the things that were done in the past that you could have learned from. And so um, now you have encouraged me to, um, to go and read about Bessie Smith. Why? Because I knew Bessie Smith um, was because when I was at another institution, um, they would always do arts uh, week. And they said, we need you to sing um, this song because we didn't think that the student's voice was sultry enough. And so <laughs> I sang a Bessie Smith song with the jazz band. That's um, tremendous. Yeah, so, Doctor, uh, you have uh, so many talents, uh, the, the uh, capacity to sing and um, uh, your educational achievement, achievements. And I can see why you're a, a botanist because you've extracted every thought that I can come up with on Black history today. Well, well thank you so much. Uh, thank you. This is our guest, our former governor of the state of New York. Uh, the first black governor of the state. And we have had an enjoyable time speaking with him this afternoon, soon to be evening. And I would just like to share that we will have uh, a second of our presidential lecture series in March with the Honorable Eric Holder, the former Attorney General of the United States. And by the Thank way, Dr. Uh, Eric Holder is an old classmate of mine from Columbia University. Wow. Uh, and um, uh, all the Columbia men seem to have this uh, interest and attraction to the women from Manhattanville College, including Cheryl McNeil, who invited <laughs> me to speak here today. And I'd also like to thank Dr. Kimberly Whitehead for setting the whole thing up. Oh, yeah. uh, thank you. Thank you. And um, I look forward to that time that we can get together in person. And thanks to our listening audience. And we appreciate your participation today. Thank you.